There we are. Okay. Carefully watching my step. This is kind of... This is it. This is it. This is really the Rainbow Warrior, people. The, uh, there's always a lot of mythology, I guess, associated with ships and boats of any kind, but probably of any, any vessel on the seas today, this would be the one with the most to tell and the most for um, the world to, um, to really listen to. We're going on board right now. And... Um, here we go. This is this is the uh, the ship that um, has been through so much and much of it in our name, and um, also again through the support of a global community of people that care deeply about the planet, the oceans in particular. You know, that's the thing about oceans. You know, the People spend more time, obviously, on land. The oceans are just this vast, mysterious area. It's easier to forget about them. Yes, it's one of the main purposes for uh, the use of our ships. We do a lot of work all across the planet, um, but especially, you know, protecting important fisheries that uh, you know, don't belong to any one nation or any one company. They belong to all of us. And so that ships have a unique ability to go to the place where there's overfishing or destructive fishing methods, um, so that we can try and create reforms, have better fishing practices, sustain those fisheries for generations to come, and not just have them be exploited in the next year. How do you decide uh, priorities? Uh, uh, what to, there is so much, it's overwhelming for many people to think about, and let alone do something about. How do you decide? what you are going to do say, well, next. Yep, so it's, uh, you're right, there's so much challenges that we all face. Uh, as a global organization, Greenpeace really tries to focus on global environmental problems because we feel that that's where we're best situated to affect change. So that's, uh, you know, global deforestation issues, uh, global ocean issues, like fisheries, protection, and of course, climate change. Um, so here in the Pacific Northwest, what we're particularly focused on um, in Oregon and Washington is making sure that this special place doesn't become a fossil fuel for the uh, industries aims to ship coal to Asia. Um, beautiful river, and it will be uh, a serious impact here to the communities and the ecosystem. Um, but even you know beyond that, there's a huge amount of carbon pollution that's sitting right now underground, safely, uh, in Montana, Wyoming, the Carter River Basin. And if the coal industry is able uh, to create these coal export terminals here on the Columbia River and Washington State up in Bellingham, uh, it would allow them to ship you know millions of tons of coal abroad, uh, and we can't afford that. This is one of the uh, critical checks next few years to protect our climate and that's why we're here to make sure that we can be as supportive, uh, collaborative as possible with all the great work that's happening uh, what to keep coal off the I w One thing I really want to ask, let's walk a little bit down, I want to, to see more of, the, of this amazing, amazing ship. Um, we talk a lot here about the carrying capacity of the land and how we have exceeded it to our current dismay, at, uh, you know, Washington and Oregon are are mainly Oregon right now, locked in this kind of um, debate over putting another massive bridge across the Columbia River in order to address uh, traffic congestion, uh, which is a, a terrible idea for so many reasons, it's not even funny, but what it does, at least, is it, um, it 
addresses the problem of um, carrying capacity. And we have indeed reached, it would seem, this should tell everybody we've reached the carrying capacity of the land and exceeded it, and now we're paying the price. It's obvious here, but what about on the ocean? Do you see evidence that uh, the, the people, the species, have exceeded the carrying capacity of the oceans? That's a good question. I mean, I think that it goes to, um, you know, questions of how the resources that are publicly held are managed, because, uh, you know, over 90% of some of the most critical fish species have been overfished in recent years. Uh, but those uh, fisheries could be sustained if we manage them appropriately. If we look uh, at the long term and make sure that we're only taking the amount of resources that could then resustain themselves uh, for generations to come. So I think you know that's sort of one way of approaching this issue of carrying capacity is, is looking at how our resources that you know, need to be used by people all across the world and also the ecosystems that are part of um, how they can be managed for the long term. What's up here? Well, a plane is up there, that's for sure. Um, so work is going on. I mean, like, anybody who's ever had a, a boat of any size, it's like, you know, constant, isn't it? Yes, it's a, it's a, it's a new vessel, but uh, there's always... Uh, Where's the old one? The old uh, Rainbow Warrior uh, was nearing the end of its life uh, in terms of being able to sail safely across the Pacific and the other unique needs that we have for it. So we donated it to uh, an organization in Bangladesh, and it's now a floating hospital. I like um, that. Yeah. They would make wonderful, oh, like a teaching. Uh, yeah, right now I think center as yeah, well. Yep. Uh, they they need it as a hospital, so that's what they chose to use yeah. it as, and, and it'll certainly have many more years of productive life. Um, you know, docked in, in, in Bangladesh, serving the people there. And I think too, it's important, I think, for people to know that in Bangladesh, having a, a floating hospital is a very good idea. Bangladesh is a lot of water, and it floods every year. Some now climate change is more so than ever. But um, frequently, whatever is, uh, is able to float is the only thing that survives. So, treating people in floods, I, I, I could see what a brilliant idea that would be. Um, oh, here we have the um, names and faces of the Arctic 30. These are the folks that are in prison. Um, many of the crew of the Rainbow Warrior here have sailed. People before, so they're you know very close, and we're thinking about how we can get them free every day. What kind of communication do you have? Can they are they able to use um, phones or computers, or is that I'm sure that's just they're not. No, very little communication. They're able yeah. to um, write letters occasionally um, to their family, um, but that's about it. And um, I, I, I perhaps I've asked you this, but I do want to to know more. Um, the next step, what are they? What's what's um, coming up? Are they? Will they have a trial? There's of been uh, hearings over recent weeks uh, that have been uh, where the Russian authorities have charged them uh, with hooliganism. That's uh, yes. yeah, very serious. Uh, charge but that's the main charge. Years. Is there? Is that's there? That's it. Um, and as for what comes next, I mean, doing everything we can to get them free. So um, that involves you know, calling on the Russian authorities, um, the ambassador, various governments around the world that have been weighing in. Uh, and so, yeah, we want to see that more in the weeks to come because we think that that's what's going to be needed uh, to make sure that they can get out and see the family. And Greenpeace and the, the Rainbow Warrior is to continue to do the work that they do uh, despite the loss of um, critical members of the, of the whole crew. So uh, that alone is remarkable. And um, this being the video part of the, of the interview, I do want to once more ask you for where people can go to lend their support 
and stand up in solidarity with all of you. So people can learn more about uh, the organization, the Rainbow Warrior, and how they can get involved to help free the Arctic 30 at greenpeace.org. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it, Jeff. Thanks a lot.